also uh, we resume proceedings. Uh, may I take this opportunity to remind you again uh, that it is a criminal offence in the laws of this country to lie under oath. It is also an offence to provide false testimony to the Truth Commission. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, before I resume the questioning proper, I just want to get this confirmation from you uh, that uh, you have received a document containing warnings informing you that, uh, among other things, you have a right not to incriminate yourself. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, in your testimony today, you have clearly incriminated yourself in crimes. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, do we take it that you incriminated yourself in crimes in full knowledge of your right not to incriminate yourself? and the fact that you had previously been warned not to incriminate yourself. Yes, sir, I fully understand. Do you agree that you have been warned not to incriminate yourself by way of a document which you have signed prior to your testimony? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So now let's proceed with regards to Aladi Kebe. His description of events is completely at odds with yours. You realize that? Yes, sir, I do. And uh, in fact, how he was dealt with soon after the shooting is also at odds with your description. Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, I want to read out from his, uh, this transcript of his testimony. And uh, I am reading from line 717 of page 33 of the transcript. Uh, let me give you the date of the transcript. The date of the transcript is Tuesday, 9th April, 2019. And uh, in line 717, this is what he had to say. He was asked, what were you feeling at that time, referring to the time after he was shot? And he responded as follows, I was feeling horrible. Somebody who is shot, you cannot estimate the pain you have at that time. So when I fall down, shall he meant to say, he went to extend to complete me once and for all, he referring to you. So he was stopped by Sana. So that is where I was lying down. I was lying on a pool of blood. So Sana asked me to get up. I told him, sir, I cannot on my own since on my own. He decided to assist, assist me to get up later. Later on, he felt reluctant. He decided to sit back and call my name. Corporal Kebe, I said, yes, sir. He said, try and get up. I forced myself with the help of, of the left leg. At that time, this right leg was completely finished. So I sit back. Then I started feeling the pain, which I cannot estimate. I asked them to finish me once and for all because I cannot resist the pain. So that is the time Sana started shouting, call me the medic, call me the medic. They rushed and called the medic. They came with the first aid kit and they tell me, and they tell them, you cannot treat this man here. He is dying in our hands. Take him. That is how I was dragged to the clinic. What do you say to that? Well, I say it is also uh, contrary to the evidence that Sana also gave, the one that uh, you uh, presented here. 
uh, the one that you read out to me. And this is and not a true, accurate, uh, sorry, an accurate uh, uh, depiction of what happened. What is the contradiction? <clears throat> sorry, with Sanas? Sana said that he applied a tourniquet. This man said that uh, he, uh, that um, they called for the medics and then he was rushed to the hospital. He was uh, taken to the clinic, <coughs> as uh, far as I can recall. That is where he was taken. Yes, uh, there may not necessarily be a contradiction. This guy said they came with the first aid kit and somebody said you cannot treat this man here, he is dying in our hands. That is when they took him to the clinic. And Sana also said that he called the medics, he asked that he be taken to the clinic. The only thing that is missing in this man's statement is that Sana applied the tonic, uh, whatever it is, and this man limits himself to saying that they brought a first aid kit. So there isn't much of a contradiction, a material contradiction for that matter. In fact, uh, he didn't even fall off the chair. He, uh, he sat on the chair. Well, and, and as far as I can recall, there was no conversation between him and Sana, and he was not saying uh, that uh, the pain is too much that one should finish him. No, he kept quiet. He was in shock. Well, this is the witness saying he said that. I don't doubt that, but what I can recall are the facts that I have already presented with the commission, to the commission, sorry. Which essentially is denying responsibility for the shooting. No, sir, I am not. Uh, denying being the person who actually fired the shot that injured Alaji Kevin. Yes, sir. Even in the face of the victim's own evidence that he was there, he saw you and that you are the one who shot, fired a shot at him. Sir, I have already told the commission that I had shot somebody else. The commission was not aware of that. Whatever I have done, I will admit. What I have not done, I cannot admit to that. Uh, we appreciate that what I am doing is presenting the evidence to you because the Commission has to be able to assess how you react to the evidence presented to you. If, is it just simple de denials, mere denials, or is it a denial that is based on something concrete, or is it just uh, an avoidance of responsibility? So, so I have to put the evidence to you. Not only did Kebe who's the victim sitting there, seeing you, has testified that you fired, you fired the shot at him. Sana Sabali, the vice chairman of the AFPRC at the time, also supported Kebe's testimony that you fired a shot at him. Well, sir, I would just like to remind the commission that even among the testimonies of what happened at Yundum camp immediately we returned from Fajara barracks. You've got several different versions. But let's focus no, no, on this one. Yes, sir. I just want to explain that it is not unusual for you to have different versions of the same uh, story or, of, or of, sorry, of the same, same event because it happened so long ago. But in this in instance, Mr. Singate, you have the actual victim saying, he fired at me. You have the person sitting right next to the alleged shooter. That person also said that this person is the shooter. You have a third person who was also a bystander pointing to the same person as the shooter. You think all three of them lied against you? Sir, I'm not saying that they lied. I'm just saying that they did not see me discharge that round into his leg. So I was holding my pistol and pointing, and I threatened him that I would shoot. And then, pam, like everybody had said, somebody shot him from the side. So it was just a coincidence. I will shoot you, and pam, it went. No, they say no, it's it, it was not one threat. It was a process of interrogation. That is exactly what it was. 
Look, I have admitted, I have already admitted to things that are much graver. And I said, like I said, if I did it, I would have had no problems owning up to it. But uh, I, sorry, if you would allow. No, go ahead, go ahead. I do admit that the whole circumstances, the whole circumstance uh, surrounding this was really my fault. I am at error, and as an officer, I take my responsibility. Uh, yes, Mr. Singate, that may very well be okay uh, on, on the moral side of things. But, but the commission would make its decision, not on the basis of moral issues, but on legal considerations. And what we have seen is an avoidance of direct responsibility whenever you are accused of being the person who shot, you, you avoid responsibility for that and claim responsibility on the basis of some moral ground. We are focused and fixated on the legal considerations. The evidence we have so far of all the people who were present there, who've been interviewed, all three of them pointed at you as the shooter. You deny that. Yes, sir. Just because there are three or ten doesn't mean that it happened in that manner. But it is more likely that their story would be more believable than the story of the accused person who cannot even identify who the shooter is. Sir, for me, my conscience is more important. As long as my conscience is clear in an issue, it doesn't matter how funny it looks, I will stick to what I know. Mr. Singata, is it conscience here? Or is it an effort to run away from direct responsibility? Sir, I am not running away from direct responsibility. So the, well, the commission has the evidence, and yes, the sir. commission would make up its mind as to who the shooter was. But I just remind that in the face of three different types of participants in this process, the direct victim, the person who was right next to the alleged perpetrator, and another person who was present there, all of them pointing to one person as being the shooter. And that person conveniently said, I merely threatened, and as I was threatening, a shot went bam, it was in me, it was somebody else, it smells like that person is running away from responsibility. Sir, it's not convenience. The convenient thing for me to have done was to just say, yes, I did it, and apologize and beg for forgiveness. Uh, but that does Sir, not absolve one from responsibility, it does, does it? No, it does not. But even within the face of this evidence, it also may not as well. In fact, I'm even going out on a limb because if at all, at the end of the day, the commission feels that, no, this man misled the commission, I am in even more trouble. So I, 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 am, I am just trying to state exactly the facts as I recall and what I know, even if it means me being seen in a light that uh, is, not, is not good for me. Well, and even if it means somewhere down the line, I will face the consequences. You Just because there are some people who have said, this is the way it happened, doesn't mean that it exactly happened that way. Well, if the people have a reason to know, they were present there, they, they saw, saw it happen, happen. They, they have no reason to lie against you. And they give this story, which is consistent in every material particular. Don't you think their testimony ought to be believed? Sir, I is that this commission has already received testimony about the killing of Fafanyang, about EMCC, about Bakari Kamara, which are completely divergent of one another. Uh, the same event, but so many different narrations. Uh, sorry, Basil, uh, uh, different narrations of the same event. Yes, so what I'm trying to say Mr. is Singate. that being such a long time difficult
accepted giving no, the I'm order. No, I'm not talking about myself. Just a moment. Yes. You have accepted giving the order for those killings, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. Good. So it's not necessary to go into all those details any further. I was given an example. Yes. Uh, but on this particular one, and unlike the cases you've just identified, there is great consistency between the three witnesses or among the three witnesses. All of them point to you as the shooter. And that is a fundamental difference, isn't it? So you know what my concern is? That uh, somehow on certain uh, events, there is an uncanny consistency whilst other events there is complete divergence of views. But isn't that natural, Mr. Singer? That is exactly that what that is exactly what I'm coming to say. That is because it is normal. natural, then why are you giving that uh, the, uh, these three um, testimonies more weight than what I said? I can only tell you what I know. But isn't that only natural, Mr. Singer? Sir, you have three witnesses. All of them give a story that is strikingly similar and consistent against the statement of the accused or the person being accused which is a mere denial what is more likely to believe sir vis-a-vis -vis the time that has passed and the so many different stories that have come out subsequently definitely it is odd that uh, that such a thing has happened because is, I know for odd, a fact. What is odd that has happened? No, what is odd is that uh, these three have, well, in fact, uh, Fatih's testimony is not consistent 100% with either of them. Uh, in the material element, they are consistent 100%. But, yes, but you cannot just cherry pick the evidence, you have to take it within context. Uh, Mr. Singate, we are all lawyers, we yes. both lawyers, we all know that you focus on the relevant and material parts. You don't have to focus on every little element, you don't have to focus on all the little You have to focus on those material bits and not everything. In every situation, when two people see something, they all see things differently. Sir, facts that are relevant to the fact in issue exactly. are, facts relevant. That are relevant. Facts that are relevant to the fact in issue have to be taken into consideration. But and that is what I'm trying to point out. The surrounding facts that are relevant to the fact in issue, which is the shooting, are inconsistent. And I would like the Commission to look at that, not just look but at... Mr. Singer, what is consistent is the fundamental issue. Who pulled the trigger that shot the victim? That is the material issue here. And all three witnesses are consistent and refer to you. Uh, if you deny, you continue to deny, you would leave it at that and the commission would be made of it now. But it looks like that it is more likely that the evidence of these three consistent witnesses is more believable than the evidence of the person who is accused of having committed the violation, who offers nothing else beyond I merely threaten and coincidentally bang the person is caught. You know, I'm aware of all of this. And like I told you, I could have easily taken the easy route out. But is that the reason if I stand out? by my... Of course it is, because this back and forth and this cross-examination making me appear as if I'm not telling the truth before the whole world is, is, is not the easy way out. Does it look like you are not telling me? Because that is what you are trying to insinuate. But does that it look like it? That you are not speaking the truth? That is what you are insinuating. Perhaps that is a conclusion to be drawn from this. If you want to draw your conclusion, no, sir... I don't draw the conclusion. You but, the conclusion to me. Yes, but you have already drawn some conclusions with regards to me. And, uh, no, I have not. I have just presented the evidence to you and uh, made a proposition to you. These two stories, 
the three consistent stories of these three witnesses. A victim, somebody who was there with you doing the interrogation, and the spectator, all three of them say, you did it. And you sat there and saying, well, it just happened when I was threatening him, but it was in me. Which of these two stories is more believable? Well, sir, now you're trying to trivial, uh, trivialize my, my testimony. No, I am characterizing your testimony as it is. But, sir, you are not supposed to characterize my evidence. You are supposed to present it, uh, analyze it, and present it to the commission, but, sir. But it is my job to put propositions to you. And in putting propositions to you, I cannot do it in a vacuum. It has to be in a particular context. And that is why I have to characterize the evidence as I see it and put it to you. It behoves you to answer which way you want. You either accept the proposition or you deny it. That's the way to conduct a cross examination, isn't it? What I want to know is the, the purpose of the proposition. Is it that you feel that it is going to change my testimony uh, for admission? Possibly. I would expect candor yes. in the testimony. Of course. So if I feel that perhaps putting a question in a particular way can elicit the truth out of you, I would do so. so That's why I'm here. You are saying that what I've told you is not the truth. Well, what I'm saying is that there are two conflicting positions and I have put those positions to you. You tell us what you believe is the truth. Sir, I believe myself. Otherwise, I would not have stated this evidence before the commission. And I would not have gone I, out on a limb. I would not have. And in spite of the fact that all the evidence to the contrary is strong, it corroborates one another, in every material particular, you still believe that that evidence is wrong. It doesn't corroborate in every material, uh, material particular. There are inconsistencies in their own testimonies. Okay. And I stand by my own, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the you. commission <coughs> would make up its mind on, on that particular issue. Yes, so sir. now uh, let us move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> Sana Sabali. He was subsequently arrested, wasn't he? Yes, sir, he was. <clears throat> Can you tell us what happened? Yes, sir. Um, prior to Sana Sabali's arrest uh, and detention at mile two, um, I will say uh, a number of weeks. I cannot remember exactly how long. Uh, Jamme uh, was, uh, well, he had informed me that he believed that Sana wanted to launch a coup, that he was going to unseat him, either um, he was going to shoot him or uh, tie him up and uh, take him to Mal to, any, to depose him. Yes, sir. Um, what you said is that Jame told you that yes, he believed. Yes, sir. Uh, did he give you any evidence to support that belief? Well, as time, he kept on informing me of his fear of what was going to happen. It, it, it was, it was uh, something that was constant, that, uh, he, uh, that Sana was going to take over. And as time went on, uh, he became stronger in his accusations uh, and uh, was pointing to the behavior of Sana. <coughs> Two things. Yes, sir. First. Sana wanted to depose him. The second is he was pointing to the behavior of Sana. Yes, sir. Right. As, as proof, as evidence for me. Right. Uh, what in the behavior of Sana did he use as evidence to show that this man really intended to depose him or to kill him? Yes, sir. Um, the relationship between members of council had deteriorated to a point. And uh, this was just almost six months into 
the AFPRC government. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Proceed, please. Yes, sir. In fact, I think I said yesterday uh, that uh, even the selection uh, of uh, council, the manner in which uh, it happened, might have been the starting point for animosity. Uh, animosity between who and who? Yes, between Jamme and uh, Sanasabali, and between Sanasabali and myself. And your relationship with Sana, personally, did yes. it in fact deteriorate further? Uh, my relationship with Sana did deteriorate because there were two events that occurred which actually brought a rift between myself and Sana. Bad blood between the two of you? A rift, not, well, a rift. We would uh, not see eye to eye. I, I believe that there was a rift, there was, uh, uh, I wouldn't go to say that it was bad blood, but obviously there were problems. And I can explain, uh, I mean, if you would, uh, if, if you wish. Uh, proceed, Mr. Singhate. If, if this is something you think you should explain, please, by all means, go ahead. Yes, sir. The first incident uh, occurred shortly after um, the 1994 takeover. I had visited uh, Auntie Jojo, uh, Uncle Sarah Jangha's wife. He was the former Secretary General, to see how they were doing. And Auntie Jojo had complained that her Mitsubishi uh, uh, Gallant had been seized by Sana Sabali and that it did not belong to government and it was seized because he believed that it was a government car and I promised her that I would do my best to retrieve it because I knew it didn't belong to government she was a genuine businesswoman and the car belonged to her so when I approached am I speaking too fast for the interpreters yeah. or is it fine yes Okay, okay, they yeah. said you're fine, but okay. if you can slow down a bit. Okay, thank sir. You. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, so when I uh, approached Sana, he told me, no, that the car belonged to government. So I tried to explain, and uh, we, we disagreed. It was, it was an exchange of words. Now, ordinarily, uh, he's my senior. He was senior to me in the army, senior to me in government. I should not have. But the manner in which um, he, he responded, I didn't like. And so I felt that I needed to put my, uh, my, my, my points across, and it didn't end that well. He refused to release the vehicle, and uh, that was it. Now, secondly, uh, the second incident was also involving another, another vehicle, but this one was closer to home. This one involved my family. Now, I, uh, uh, my official vehicle was, uh, went for maintenance. And in the interim, I was given uh, a, temp uh, a vehicle to use until uh, my official vehicle uh, was returned from the garage. Now, I traveled uh, and with, with, with Sadibu Hydra. Now, in my absence, In my absence, uh, I understand that he called the house and got my brother Peter, and he demanded the vehicle. And Peter told him, well, I'm sorry, sir. When Edward travels, he gives the key to the official vehicle to my mom so that it would not be misused by any of the soldiers in his absence. And my mom would not even relinquish the key to me. And Sana Sabali got mad. He said that, he, he, that Peter should tell my mother to re, uh, release the keys immediately. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and then he hung up. But it didn't end there. I think uh, he called again and then demanded the vehicle. And Peter told him, well, my mother still has not released the keys. So what Sana told Peter was, look, if your mother does not release the keys, I will send a truck of soldiers, and they will come and arrest your mother and the key. So Peter um, had panicked 
because I leave my number whenever I travel. But by then, there were no mobile phones. You call the house and leave your number. They called and informed me of this. And he begged me, just release the, the, the vehicle back to Sana. Uh, so with my family's uh, security at stake and me not being there, and Peter not being a council member, just a mere officer in the Gambia National Army, I, I asked my mother to release the key and the vehicle, which was done. But I called Jamme and I complained and I told him that, look, this is what is happening. Are we not all supposed to be a family? How can a colleague threaten my mother of all people? I am not accepting this. I uh, cut the mission short. We came back. Uh, immediately, I landed and Jame knew that I was around. He sent for me and we had a meeting in his office uh, together. I can recall was, I know San, uh, Saadi Buhayda was there. Uh, I was there. Sa, uh, Sana Sabali was there with Jame. I cannot recall Yankuba. It's possible he was there, but I'm not sure. So I confronted Sana. And uh, I addressed him very bitterly because I was hurt. He apologized, though, but the damage had already been done. And I felt that if this is a colleague that would threaten my family, in my absence, you can threaten me with arrest or detention or whatever for uh, not uh, obeying a, a, a command, but my family, for not uh, doing anything, I felt very hurt. But and proceed, proceed. Yes, sir. and anyway, uh, to cut uh, uh, the story a little bit shorter, he apologized, but the damage had already been done. Now, with, between, so, so that was the problems between me and Sana. So with Jamme, sorry, sir, yes. Uh, you must have been so terribly hurt by this as to abort an official mission you were sent to. Of course I was. I was hurt and concerned for the security of my family. But there was no security threat at the time, was there? Well, if the vice head of state tells your family that he's going to uh, come and arrest a key with a truckload of soldiers. That, of course, is a security threat. I understand that, but that threat was already averted by handing over the vehicle and the keys, wasn't yeah. it? But nonetheless, I, I, we all knew of Sana's erratic behavior. But the mere fact that this threat was already neutralized, and you still decided to abort that mission because you were that angry. Doesn't it reflect a little bit of an extreme behavior on that occasion? Absolutely not. You, In think, fact, you no. think that was measured action? Well, sir, I felt that my f I needed assurances I needed assurances that my family were safe. And coming back on the ground and getting them was the only thing that I could do. Couldn't it have waited? Waited. My mother, my family, soldiers. It could not. But this threat was not imminent. The as threat far, was averted. As far as I was concerned, the mere fact that it was made was uh, an indication that we were not safe. I didn't know where this was going to end up. If it was for a mere vehicle, a key, it could be for something else that I might not know. So I needed assurance and, uh, well, assurance that we were safe, we were okay, and this was not going to happen again. So I immediately cut short my mission. That you, and you think that that is not extreme anger, that is measured action. That's what you think. Wherever I travel in the world, if my family is threatened or they feel threatened, I would travel back to make sure that they are safe and they are also reassured. Remember, it's not only about me. It is also about my family. If my mother and my wife and my children feel do not feel safe, I have to reassure them. Uh, but, but this is the, this, the crux of the matter is, 
does it really matter for you whether the threat is imminent or whether the threat is averted already? Does it make a difference to you? Of course it does. But this, this was persistent because Sana Sabali was there and if he could go to that extent, then once, then he could do it again. So that's why I need assurance. I needed to allay the fears of my family and also have my own assurance that this was not going to happen again. Your family being threatened. I'm not talking if it was myself. I could understand. That's fine. But my family, that, that, that alone is extreme and unacceptable. You have deep-seated anger against Sana for that. Correct? I know where you are trying to, to drive, but that is not the case. It was not, had nothing to do with any judgment in the future. I know what you're trying to do, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Singata, maybe you're trying to smell too far away. No, no, no. I, I, we are here now. Let's we are here, <laughs> and we will reach there in a few minutes, and you will raise it again, and <laughs> everyone all, is here. We all know the drill. Absolutely, so sir. anticipate the questions and, and deal with them. I but will, it's sir. quite obvious, isn't mm -hmm. it, Mr. Singate, that there was bad blood between yourself and Sana Sabali during this period? Like I had said, he apologized, we made up, but my trust in him had dwindled and there was a rift. This is the way I put it, this is the way I see it. If you interpret it as bad blood, I didn't look at it as bad blood at the time. We would have still gone into combat together if we had to go into action subsequently. And I would have followed his orders and stood by him as my commander. I would have done that as a loyal soldier. And with opportunity also to stick the dagger at him, you oh. probably would. Oh, no, sir. I, I take exception to that, sir. Well, let's see what happens afterwards. No, no sir. We will not take, uh, uh, I mean, see what happens afterwards. I'd never stabbed anyone in the back, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm I not am like not that. suggesting that no, you, you stab said, anybody in the back. No, but you said, and take the opportunity to do so, sir. No, that no, that is I, a bit expensive. Well, uh, don't take any offense. I don't mean to be offensive. Okay. If, if you find it offensive, I withdraw that. Okay. But uh, you, uh, my purpose is not to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. What I said is I put this proposition to you. You told us that in spite of that rift, you can go to war with him yes. and gladly of course. serve as his subordinate. A absolutely. Follow him as your commander. Yes, definitely. I put the contrary proposition to you. No. And with opportunity, if you have the dagger to stick in him, you would stick it. Answer yes or no. No, sir. That's uh, really... I. I really do take exception to the fact that you would even put that proposition to me. That is unfair. And I would never have done that to anyone. I think that is, that is an answer that would satisfy me. I would take it that in spite of the rift, if you have an opportunity to be fighting with Sana, you would not fight him. That is what you suggest. Of course, I would follow him and follow his orders. Okay, but, but if the table turns, he becomes your perceived enemy. What would you do? Well, that is a different scenario. But that is exactly the scenario that I'm trying to portray. What I'm trying that to say... The opposite is, the opposite to what you suggest, that in spite of that rift, if you were to go to war with him, presupposing that you are on the same side, you would willingly follow him as your commander. Absolutely. Okay. But you would also agree with me that the opposite is true, that in view of that rift that is in between you, right, if a problem were to emanate between you, you would not mind sticking the dagger in him if you have the opportunity to do so. That is the proposition I am making. Do you agree or you would not do it? You see, I have a problem with the way you have put this, uh, this proposition. First of all, uh, the, uh, the idiom sticking the dagger to him means to betray somebody. That is a betrayal. Uh, and so I, I would don't not think have I don't take it so. Sticking yes, but the dagger you, yes, it's means, a saying. It's means a, stabbing the person. It does not necessarily stabbing the have a connotation of it being a betrayal. Well, if at all that is what you mean. That is what I mean. What I will say is that in spite 
of anything, whether there was uh, animosity between us or not, if he became an enemy, then we would have to deal with each other subsequently. Okay, let's proceed then. Yes, sir. All right. So what happened after you have received, after this particular incident, and well, uh, you returned, you cut short your mission, and you returned to Gambia. There was a meeting at Jame's office. Yes, sir. He apologized. Yes, sir, he did. And then what happened afterwards? Well, we, we shook hands and then buried the hatchet. But like I said... But you did not break the rift. Obviously, like I told you, the, 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 uh, my faith and trust in him had dwindled. And obviously, that was, I mean, they created, uh, it, it created a rift. Proceed, please. So, with regarding him and uh, uh, Jame at the time, um, truly, his, his uh, attitude towards Jame had, uh, had also taken uh, a turn south. Um, he was not that respectful as... Uh, when we started off, it gradually dwindled to an extent where it culminated, I would not say culminated because there were several events. Um, I cannot uh, recall them off the top of my head. I do know that uh, some of them happened and Jame did explain. Uh, but the major one and one that I had seen was when uh, Sana Sabali had just finished work uh, he uh, left, uh, he went downstairs to the back uh, staircase, uh, not the front staircase of the building. And because the former president's office is where the current vice president sits. Uh, and um, the former vice president's office is directly underneath the former uh, president's office. And they share the same stairwell at the back to go down. And as Minister of Defense, I was underneath. And I also share the same stairwell, but I'm on the ground floor. Now, Sabali left, well, sorry, came down to go. And Jamme followed uh, almost immediately. Uh, when Sana Sabali was about to enter his car, Jamme called him, vice. And Sana Sabali made a gesture like this uh, as if to uh, insinuate that uh, he was not willing to, uh, to, to, to answer. And so Jamme pointed to me as, uh, well, Jamme pointed that incident to me as proof of the fact that this man had come so far, he doesn't respect him anymore, and he's hell bent on getting rid of him. Is that proof of the suggestion that Sana wanted to depose Jamme? Absolutely not proof, but I, I am telling you what Jame tried to show me as proof okay. through, 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 through Sana Sabali's behavior. So you would agree with me that at most or at best, this just amounted to proof of disrespect of by, by Sana of, of Jame. Yeah, absolutely. And, and nothing more. Well, of course, at that point, however, however, one could be suspicious of the fact that something is wrong. You don't just get disrespectful like that and uh, expect things to be smooth, that they, there's nothing going on. There must be an underlying reason. Fair enough. Proceed. Yes, sir. So as time uh, drew near, um, Jamme had informed me that Sana Savali was going to launch on a particular day. And prior to that, he was also trying to tell me that, look, Sana Sabali sees you as one of my allies. And if he comes for me, he's going to come for you. Uh, are you suggesting that Jame was brainwashing you? Uh, he was trying to make you believe uh, that both you and him were Sana's enemies, and uh, that if you do not act, Sana would act first, and both of you would be in trouble. 
I will, I will break that down into pieces because there, there, there's, there's uh, too much in it. First of all, brainwashing, no, he was not brainwashed, but he was trying to convince me that this, is, that this was the case. Secondly, um, it was not that he was asking for a preemptive strike. He never, he never mentioned that. He just wanted to convince me that, look, this is on the table, it is going to happen, and he's also going to come for you. Uh, we received evidence <coughs> that you and Jame planned to arrest Sana Sabali weeks before his arrest. Is that true? That is not true. Well, Mr. Dembanjai, who was present, explained an interesting story. Um, he said, taking it from the top of my head, that it was close to Sana's naming ceremony. And he was at State House. You and Jame were walking, and he was behind you. And Jame was to select a ram that he was going to send to Sana as a gift for his naming ceremony. <coughs> and behind you, he had the two of you conversing. You told Jame, according to him, that, but sir, we have to do it now. And Jame said, let's wait after his naming ceremony. What do you say to that? That is completely false. But strangely, Sana just got arrested a day after his naming ceremony. Yes, sir. That, but this, this statement uttered by Dembanjai is completely false. It is not true. Well. Uh, anyway, what I can tell you is that the ram that I am aware of was not for Sana's naming ceremony. It's possible that one was sent, but the ram that I am aware of was a charity that Jame wanted to take out to uh, subdue uh, both Sana Sabali and Haidara. And I will tell you how, what, what he did. Like the black bull, was it? No, no, no. Okay. This was not, well, like, like what he did. He, um, he took me, in fact, Dembenjai was not even there. But what he did, he took me, I think there was Khalifa Bajinka and a couple of others, into the, 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 the garden behind uh, uh, the, uh, the state house itself, the house. And um, he told me that he was told by a marabu or so that he should bury the ram, that these people were going to, to come for him, but he should bury the ram. And if the- Dead or alive? I'm, I'm coming, yes. He should bury the ram alive. And if the ram resists and shakes, then obviously there would be heavy resistance and fighting. Cruelty if, to animals. It was sad. If, if the ram does not, then uh, everything would go smooth and they would be arrested. So they dug the hole, a uh, couple of his oddlies, I cannot remember who and who. They put this poor ram inside and buried it. That's what they did. And Edward Singate, what did he do? Uh, my boss is taking out a charity. What am I, he believes in this thing. He believes in it so much that he doesn't do anything without uh, doing charity. What can I do? I yeah. couldn't save the poor ram. Your boss was doing cruelty to animals. Yes, exactly. You were there, you sat there and said nothing? I'm just asking questions, Mr. Singate. He believed that that had a direct uh, connection with his own security and livelihood. So if I don't think it would have even been wise to interfere. What I can assure you is that I, I abhor cruelty to animals. I don't even kill my own Tabaski ram. It's killed by somebody else. So, after the charity, uh, sorry, sir, yes? Dembanyai, he did not talk about a charity, <coughs> uh, especially one as graphic as burying a, lamb, a ram 
alive. He talked about a ram being sent to Sanasabali as a gift for his naming ceremony, which was a few days later. But at that time, he said, the two of you planned to arrest Sanasabali. That is not true. The ram that I'm aware of is what I have explained. I'm not aware of the ram that he sent. I, I, I'm just not aware of it. I don't doubt that he might have, but I am not aware of what he sent to Sanasabali. Uh, at that time, did Jami give an order for any person, any council member who came to State House after 6 p.m., apart from Edward Singate, be sought at sight? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, let me read out yeah. to you the suggestions that were made by Mr. Dembajai. Mm -hmm. He testified on the oath, and this is what he had to say. I, he was asked, you are talking about orders that were given to you by uh, Jame, that if any council member came to State House after 6 p.m., you are authorized to shoot and kill the council member, that was what he talked about before, co that's what was we talked about before the coffee break. And you told us that uh, you were given the order in the presence of Edward Singate, who was also a council member. And uh, he said that is correct. An order was given by Yaya Jame in your presence that any other council member who visited State House after 6 p.m. should be shot outside. That is not true. In fact, we used to work mostly till after 6 p.m. anyway. It was not unusual for us to be there till 8, 9, sometimes 10 o'clock at night. So I, I, don't, I cannot see the essence of this order. It's, it just doesn't make sense. Well, it made sense if council members would leave work and come to State House later. Wouldn't First, that wouldn't that be what the alleged order implied? Well, it, the order was not given in my presence. I'm not aware of this order, and to me, it doesn't make sense because council members were always there. Well, Sanasabali worked there, I worked there, but Sadi Buhaidara and uh, Yanku Bature used to frequent there. So I don't think that this order uh, was even given. So you, you, you dispute this order. Well, it's one thing to think it was not given, and another thing to be certain that it was not given. What I can say, I'm certain it was not given in my presence. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, he went on to say that one day Edward Singate and chairman were going down. I was with them. I was following closely until in the yard when we got off the stairs outside the office towards the guard room, I heard Edward Singate said, Sir, why can't we do it now? This is just the statement that I paraphrase to you. <coughs> and uh, Yajame said in Wolof, Haral be aftengintebi. That is what the witness said. That too is false in your view. That is false. I never asked Yaya Jamme to arrest or tell him, why can't we do that at any point in time? Uh, can you proceed with your testimony? Yes. Yaya Jamme told you mm -hmm. uh, that, well, look at, Singat, look at Sabali, the way he gestured at me. This is evidence of what he wants to do. Take it from there. Yes, sir. Like I said, uh, he had constantly insinuated that this was going to happen. It was imminent. In fact, let me, uh, I've, I, I forgot one little detail uh, during this Ram episode. Uh, he also, he also stated that Yankuba was also part of it. But I told him, sir, Yankuba, I don't believe so. I don't think that Yankuba would involve himself in such a thing. Uh, he's not that uh, violent in nature. And 
moreover, if he was, uh, sorry, if he was part of it, he would have been here. But at, uh, at the time, Yankuba was on a mission in Libya. And I also reminded him that, well, um, if you go ahead and, uh, and, and blame uh, Yankuba and, uh, and, and um, Haidara and Sabali, and eventually something happens and you arrest Yankuba, there's going to only be the two of us left. Yeah, but yes. at this stage, mm -hmm. Jame hasn't given you anything concrete to back his claims. That is why even with Yankuba, that is exactly what I said. It was even getting worse because with Yankuba, there was nothing to believe that he was involved at all. Proceed, please. Yes, sir. So, okay, uh, Sana Sabali's uh, naming ceremony came uh, and, and went. I cannot remember whether it was the following day or the day after. No, no, no. In fact, it was not the following day. It was not the immediate day after his, uh, his name in Saram, because we were all there in Brikama. And we came home late. It must have been in the following days. Now, Jamme had you, told... Yes, sir. No, proceed, proceed. So Jamme had told me that he had got information that Sana was going to launch that night, uh, this particular night. And the night before he was arrested, shortly after the naming ceremony, within the, uh, the time frame. So uh, he told me that he was going to come for me first with Sadi Buhaidara, and then after me, he was going to go and attack him in Banjo. So I stayed outside with my guards within uh, the compound all night, waiting for this imminent attack. And it never came. Intermittently, Jame would call on the landline, which I could hear from where we were, and I would pick it and then tell him that no, there is, uh, there is no Sana. You know, this happened until shortly before Fajar, I believe, uh, around Fajar, and uh, he called again, and I said, no, there is no, there is no Sana. He said, no, he is going to come and then close the bridge, and then attack State House. So uh, did he did he give give you any basis of his knowledge the source of his information did he provide any well he told me it was intelligence that he received i don't know whether it was from the nia or whether it was from military intelligence i really don't know and i did not ask uh, as minister of defense yes wouldn't you be entitled to receive such intelligence? I ordinarily should have been. However, um, there was uh, um, uh, a system whereby the intelligence personnel report directly to the head of state. Yes, but that is true because the intelligence unit is under the office of the president. But as Minister of Defense, you would agree that you are entitled to intelligent information, correct? It was only when, it was only subsequently that uh, the, the intelligence, uh, like Mr. Sambaba or Daba Marena, knowing that I have been deprived of certain information or certain intelligence, that they would brief me in private. But even at this time, you had a very close relationship with Mr. Sambaba. True. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he was the head of the NIA, wasn't Absolutely he? Absolutely he was. And he, he also deprived you of this intelligence information? Maybe at that time he was not uh, aware that uh, Jambi was depriving the council, including his deputy, of, of, of information. But uh, that, is, that is quite interesting. Uh, that is quite interesting because as Minister of Defense, you are entitled to that information anyway. Yes, that is so, true. So, so he should have provided that information? No. To the Minister of Defense? Yes. No, he works, he's there, there under the President, and they report to the President, the President shares with whom he deems fit. No, but uh, this is national security in, information. 
obviously the Ministry of Defense or the Minister of Defense ought to be informed. I am quite sure up till the time that he left, uh, it, there, there are certain things that didn't go anywhere. He was the only one who received the information and kept it or dealt with it as he deemed but, fit. But seeing that up to that stage, Jame has not given you anything concrete, anything mm -hmm. that is different from the allegation against Yankuba Ture, which you did not believe anyway. Mm -hmm. Didn't you think it was necessary that you inquire further? I, I didn't inquire. Um, I didn't believe him 100%. I was taking things as they go. Wasn't it prudent that you did so, that you inquired? F uh, about the coup? About, about uh, the, uh, yeah, the alleged, uh, alleged plot against Jammeh? Yes. Well, as long as Jammeh was feeding me, I, I felt that perhaps he was getting information perhaps from a credible source or um, um, whether it was intelligence, actual intelligence or information or rumor. Um, but I, I honestly did not inquire and I did not, I did not try to get to the bottom of it. Definitely I didn't. Pro proceed, please. Yes, sir. So, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Then, uh, the night before, like I said, um, uh, after uh, Fajr, he, uh, around Fajr time, he called and told me that, Sana Sabali, should I allow you to prepare whatever you're going to throw next? <laughs> Don't be. It's um, all right, Mr. Sigate. No, it's not all right. The, the questions I'm the one come. who receives the, uh, the stones, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, don't worry, the stones will be thrown at the, li at the right time. You see, if you just admit the truth, the stones wouldn't land very heavily. Sir, Thank I, am, you. I, I am giving you the truth. Thank you, Mr. Singhati. <coughs> Proceed, please. Yes, sir. So, uh, after he informed me about Sana uh, intending to take the bridge, I went ahead uh, to the bridge with my Otlis. And... Sana Sabali passed at his usual time, and there was no event. So I uh, followed to State House uh, some distance uh, after, and then I told Jamme that, no, well, the, we never did anything, and he's in his office. And then Jamme told me that, no, he's going to launch it. Yes, he's going to launch the coup. So for the first time, Mr. Sinatra, yes, sir. at this stage, you and Jame plotted to disarm Sana Sabali. No, sir, not at that point. Let, let me explain. Yes, let me Listen explain. to the question okay, sir. and you answer. Mm -hmm. At this stage, Sana had gone to the provinces with a cache of weapons and he had returned. You made an effort with Jame to have him disturbed or to have him stripped of those weapons, didn't you? No, sir. Let me read out to you mm -hmm. what Sana Sabali had to say. Yes, sir. And in fact, I have your NIA statement on that. Okay. Here he said as follows. I asked him, what was, before this, what was your relationship like with Edward Singati? And he said, okay. If I should fast track, that is, uh, to, 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 to move forward a bit on issues, he said, the next day, that very Thursday, it is later I had to recollect and put dots together. Then I knew, yes, that was. So I asked, what did you know when you connected the dots together? He said, because he came in the morning, he said, we have to hand over the weapons because the civilians are afraid of these weapons in the state house. And of course, we were, de we were dealing with civilians. The transcript reads, we, we were doing with civilians. So, so that must be a mistake. It should be, we were dealing with civilians. So I complied. I said, I would bring the weapons in the afternoon. 
So when I went home, I asked the guards to bring out these weapons, clean them, and take them back to the armory in State House. Is this true or false? No, sir. What uh, Sana is referring to right now is completely different. These were heavy weapons. They were support weapons. They were not the normal weapons that he and his uh, soldiers would carry. So they needed to be returned to the armory. They're not weapons that you can even use in, in close quarter combat, and they would not have been effective in State House. So, uh, so, so, so it's, it's, it's completely beside the point. Uh, no, it's not beside the point. It is. Uh, what are the question I asked? Yes, sir. Is that, did you and Jame, at that stage, make an effort to t remove weapons from Sana Sabali, those who are in his possession? Sir, the weapons that were uh, retrieved were support weapons. The the seven, uh, sorry, the 12.7 millimeter anti-aircraft. But these are weapons, nonetheless. Yes, but they are not weapons that are ordinarily in the possession of uh, Sana and his people. They maintain their weapons. Uh, Mr. Singate, yes. I am not questioning. Yes the lawfulness no 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 it's not about the lawfulness just just hear yes. me out i'm not questioning mm -hmm. the lawfulness or the reasonableness of your demand for him to surrender the weapons to the armory i'm not questioning that the question i asked is did this happen as a matter of fact what happened as a matter of fact was that the support weapons were requested to be kept. But I want to make some, one, one important point, because people listening, or perhaps members of the commission, might feel that Sana Sabali was disarmed. He was not disarmed. Those support weapons were not uh, meant for everyday use. They, they, uh, it's different from their personal weapons, which they kept. They kept their 40 millimeter grenade launchers. They kept their AK-47s. They kept their uh, personal rifles and their pistols. But the, the anti-aircraft <laughs> uh, weapon, obviously, and I think the mortars too, we really, you know, were, uh, uh, were retrieved, and for good reason. Uh, well, Sana has a different take on it. And this is what he had to say. Uh, he continued his testimony by saying uh, that uh, okay, he had to, he was to return this to the armory in State House where they belongs to. And he, Edward Singate, on this particular evening, he visited me in the Fajara residence. But for me later, I come to put dots together. He was there to confirm that we have no weapons. I said, weapons for what? He said, in the event, if there was going to be fighting between me and them, they would overpower us. And then I asked, and what happened on that Friday? And then he went on to say that on that Friday, it was normal, I was writing a letter that is when she was arrested. Mm. So in Sana's mind, the effort to strip him of those weapons all formed part of the conspiracy between yourself and Yaya Jame to have him arrested and purge him permanently from the AFPRC. What do you say to that? No, that unfortunately is misconceived and it, uh, I'm, uh, well, it's not su surprised because he was the victim in this case, but because obviously we'll try to connect dots and reason, but to me it, ha it was not related and uh, it had nothing to do with his but, arrest. But in hindsight, wouldn't that be a reasonable conclusion for anybody in Sana's position to arrive at? If I was in Sana's shoes, perhaps I would also jump to the same conclusion. So Therefore, yes. that conclusion is reasonable under the circumstances. 
Well, viewing uh, it, uh, what he has been through, of course, it's, it's reasonable enough for him, but I can tell you, that was not the reason. Uh, pro proceed, please. So when, yes, sir. Let's proceed, please. Okay, I'm just trying to see which boulder is coming my way next. That's all. <laughs> but, sorry. Yeah. But anyway, to be um, uh, on a more serious note, <clears throat> when uh, I uh, had informed Jamme that Sana was in his office, he told me that no, he's he's going to to launch this 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 coup. Now, what I deducted was that he was he was afraid of Sana. He was petrified. He really felt, well, from what I could see, he really felt threatened uh, by Sana. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you believed that he was really threatened by Sana? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you did not believe 100% the story that Jame was telling you? He offered no concrete evidence apart from just his mere statements and utterances. You still went along with him? Went along with what? With I will tell you at the point where I actually went along. I'm not there yet. I was still not bought 100%. But because I was reporting, like I told you the night before, when he was called, there's no Sana. All of that indicated that perhaps the, uh, the, the fear was misconceived. And even when I reported to him that the Sana did not take the bridge, nothing happened, still. So when I came to the office and I informed him, for the first time I saw Jame appear uh, before 8 p.m., sorry, before 8 a.m. He came and knocked on my uh, door at the Ministry of Defense, the back door through uh, the stairwell and he was in my office and he told me that Sana definitely is going to launch this coup. So we, we, I went together with him upstairs. We went together to his office and he told me, I will prove to you that they want, well, all along when I say Sana, I mean the, 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 uh, I mean the two, both Sana and Saadi Buhaydara. This is what uh, sorry, Mr. Yes, Senate. Um, allow me to just interject at this point. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, it looks very likely that we would not finish today. Uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Singate, can you indicate whether you can come tomorrow or you can come on Monday? And then the commissioners would decide whether they would take you on tomorrow or whether we postpone till Monday. But it's quite clear that uh, we won't finish today. Uh, and I don't think there is any point in pushing till 4.30 or 5 o'clock because we would not finish. We still have two big topics to cover. So yes, what, uh, what would you suggest, Mr. Singate? And well, uh, then the commissioners would make a decision. Well, sir, I can remember when you suggested yesterday that we might have to go sit on Friday one of the commissioners' head was shaking no. Uh, but I, I just want to say I'm, I'm at your disposal. Uh, if you want me to appear on Monday, I, I will appear on Monday gladly. Uh, and I, I will wait for any time that you are ready with me and take my leave. Yes, sir. Thank you. So. In the meantime, you can also have my passport, just in case you think that I'm going to go somewhere that I'm not supposed to go. But Mr. Singate, you know me, you know I wouldn't be needing it. Well, it was taken at the beginning, so I'm just wondering but whether you still back, need it. Giving as, back at the beginning. Uh, just, well, it's, 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 it's just a, a confirmation whether you trust me enough to stay around. If I didn't, it wouldn't have been given back in the first place. Okay, sir. Uh, I definitely will wait until the commission sits, and then I will gladly appear. 
Thank you. Uh, you are available on Monday, are you? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, yes, ma, I am. Yes, ma. Uh, lead counsel? Uh. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, yes, we can come on Monday. Yeah. In the meantime, arrangements were made with Dr. Daffe, who was to continue his testimony, and he was given a particular block of time to testify. But we would make arrangements and see if it's not possible to have his sifted, then we would uh, uh, have Mr. Singate interpose Dr. Daffe and thereafter proceed with Mr. Singhate, if need be. What timing had you given to Dr. Duffy? Second session, I think, on Monday. You think you'll, you'll, you'll need more than one session on Monday? Yeah. With the Honorable uh, well, uh, we just give it a try and see. I would make an effort to finish by 11.30, 12. Okay. You know, but um, I cannot, I, my, my, my estimates <laughs> of time have been woefully inaccurate. <laughs> so so I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't risk uh, giving one again. But we would make our best effort to complete. If we can't, we can interpose Dr. Daffe and then come back to Mr. Singhata. That is, that is if he, he is available. Yes, ma, I will make myself available. Well, we thank you very much for making yourself available and for agreeing to suspend until Monday. Lead counsel, any other matter before we close? No, no, Madam Chair. Okay. I think this would be a convenient point to stop, Mr. Singhata. As and you wish, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. See you 10 o'clock on Monday.